Hi, everybody. Uh, so welcome to my talk about securing and uh, hardening GraphQL. And I want to start by acknowledging that I don't feel like a GraphQL expert, especially here with so many Apollo people around. Um, so, but I hope that I can bring a fresh pr perspective, right? Um, so um, professionally, I work for Doensec, which is security consultancy, and we get to read a lot of source code from you know, production uh, services. And that's really cool. I like it, uh, especially because you know, it, it keeps you, basically, you get to see the new technology as it gets developed and as it gets introduced in real world environments. Um, so we've been encountering GraphQL for multiple years in production. And by now, almost all engagements that we do involve you know, some form of GraphQL. Um, um, as a result, as a company, we've gained a lot of experience. Uh, in attacking GraphQL APIs, and we are trying you know, to share that experience with the community. Um, I'm uh, the maintainer of Finkul, which is you know, a leading tool for penetration testing in GraphQL, and also we, as a company, we have a blog where we publish our research, and you know, sometimes involves GraphQL as well. But all of this previous work we have been doing uh, was related to security, and it was aimed at security community. So this is actually something that we are doing first time, um, that you know, we're trying to address and talk to developers. So hopefully it goes uh, you know, well. Uh, and I'm really interested you know, to hear your feedback after the talk. OK, so uh, let's start uh, you know, by looking at how attackers, penetration testers, security professionals might see GraphQL security. Um, and you know, this mirrors you know, the, ways, the way we approach uh, our engagements. So generally, we start with initial phase reconnaissance where we gather information and you know, try to understand your GraphQL service, what data uh, it holds, you know, try to prioritize it and strategize about it. Um, then there is, uh, you know, generally the first vulnerabilities we will try uh, are the least specific, right? So something applicable, maybe where you can use off-the-shelf tools. And generally, they rely on security misconfigurations, right? I mean, there's also another type of you know, common vulnerability when you just don't patch your systems, but hopefully everybody here you know, is actually patching and updating their libraries and dependencies. So um, talking about security misconfigurations in GraphQL, generally the biggest risk is uh, denial of service, right? Um, so that's what we look at. And then we go to information um, leakage, right, which in GraphQL happens quite often. And it's also linked to insufficient authorization, right? So that's actually quite a big problem, very common to find vulnerabilities in this uh, group in GraphQL services. And uh, finally, the last um, kind of big attack surface uh, is injection vulnerabilities. Uh, that's the coolest, again, uh, out of this bunch, bunch because uh, they are generally the most severe ones. But I have to say that GraphQL actually does a good job of protecting from many of these attacks just because of it implements uh, uh, type checking. So let's get right into it. So first phase, reconnaissance. Um, the word is a military term, uh, which in InfoSec we kind of like to use. And re reconnaissance is basically it means uh, you know, uh, when you start, when you're trying to understand your target, right? First step. Um, and it, it includes fingerprinting, for example, right? Understanding the data and so on. And uh, if you are trying to mitigate the risk of reconnaissance, right? Or try to make attacker's life harder at this stage, uh, you might uh, find yourself at another technical term, uh, which is security through obscurity, right? And that's, again, that, that's a problem. That's not a good thing. Basically, when your security relies on some data just not being available to attacker, and I mean, not the crown jewels, right? But just you know, information about your architecture and so on. So that's not a good thing. Uh, but you need to find some balance, right? So you don't want to spend too much time on obscuring, like preventing reconnaissance. Um, you want, don't want to spend more time than attackers would spend on this uh, stage, right? Um, so uh, practically, what you could do to complicate, you know, reconnaissance? Um, you could do things like you know, redact version information. You could uh, disable introspection. Uh, you could you know, do stuff like. You know, look at the errors that uh, the server is producing. And of course, you know, there are some more generic things like you know, just trying to prevent automation and automated tooling. Um, so first example here is um, um, version automation, right? So it could be really obvious. So you just look at developer tools and you see that you know, there's a name of your library tool or whatever, right? So 
obviously, for attacker, this is valuable, right? Because it helps you understand the system, helps you know understanding what features are available. We can go through kind of uh, new updates, right, and check out what's what, what's new and what's what's made. Sometimes maybe developers even don't know that there is some functionality that was you know updated in recent versions. Um, uh, and there are many places where this information can lead, uh, not just headers, right, but you know JWT tokens, for example, and so on. Um, so it might be kind of hard to prevent this. Um, sometimes some software just provides you know easy uh, kind of toggle to do that, but oftentimes that's not the case. Um, but important to note is that this is not the only way we can do. Uh, uh, fingerprinting, right? Because uh, sophisticated attackers will always uh, find a way to understand exactly what system you are using, just because GraphQL right now is very fragmented. And although there is specification, most of the software uh, implements various optional features, right? So as an attacker, you can just test for them specifically. Uh, second thing is introspection. GraphQL enables introspection, which is amazing, right? Because it allows a lot of uh, automated uh, you know, kind of tooling like GraphQL and so on, right? Uh, nice for developers, also nice for attackers, right? Just to understand what schema is available and so on. Um, uh, disabling it usually is easy. Sometimes it just happens by default, right? When you run in, in production. Um, but the thing is that even if this introspection is enabled, you should always treat that information as public, for sure, right? And the most important step, I guess, here is if you order a pen test, don't try to hide this information from them, right? Provide it or provide a testing environment where they can just grab it because, uh, because yeah, otherwise you're paying some you know, pen testers to do kind of boring stuff that you already, you know, you know this information, you have it. You can just give it them. Um, so just for your information, there are multiple ways to recover and rebuild GraphQL schema. Uh, the easiest way is just to find some way where it's actually present, right? Like uh, it could be source code leak, but it also could be just, you know, uh, available testing or staging environment, uh, which actually, you know, has introspection enabled. And um, sometimes you could grab it from the front end code, right, or client code. Uh, you can also just build the GraphQL schema manually, right, just graph it. Um, there are tools which uh, can help you do that passively just by looking at the traffic and, you know, rebuilding the... Um, uh, types that they have seen in the traffic. And of course, you could you know, brute force that. Um, important thing to note is that error messages leak this information a lot. There's even a tool, Clairvoyance, which is really nice, which kind of does fuzzing and brute forcing, specifically looking at uh, verbose error messages and building the scheme out of them. Because some software is actually trying to be really helpful, and if you query wrong type, it will provide you kind of suggestions, right? So that's easy way to, to, to brute force. Um, verbose error messages uh, have more risk, of course, uh, because they can exp uh, expose all kinds of internal details, stack traces, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, really important, we will see this later, is also that I, I see this multiple times, where verbose error messages kind of leak internal object IDs. And we'll be talking about either specific uh, vulnerability, which kind of relies on attacker being able to leak this, right? So this is actually a big deal. Okay, and finally, you know, there are a lot of tools which are not specific to GraphQL, but which kind of provide bot protection or, you know, protection from automated tools. Uh, so for example, Cloudflare is a big one, right? And there are all kinds of others, web application firewalls, application gateways, and, you know, all of that tooling. Um, uh, important to know that, um, well, this might prevent some attacks, uh, all of these over-the-shelf tools, of course, are known to attackers. So often there will be kind of a spe specific exploit, right, that the attacker can use to just bypass it. Uh, and again, if you are doing an uh, external penetration test, uh, think about your, you know, pen testers. Try to, um, you don't want to pay them to bypass Cloudflare, right? You're not paying them for that, right? So just, you know, whitelist them. Um, okay, and before we go further, what actually makes GraphQL unique from security perspective? Um, the biggest problem is that it's kind of too new. Uh, it breaks existing security assumptions, right? So a lot of tooling, which I even mentioned before, like web application firewalls, if it's not aware of GraphQL, right, or rate limit protection for that matter, um, it might just not work, right? And the worst part in security is that if something, some security protection does not work, generally as a developer, you will not hear about it, right? Because everything will keep kind of the good path will keep working, right? So only when, you know, someone is actually testing or attacking, only then you will see that, oh, 
you know, the protection that I was paying for is not actually you know, effective. So yeah, the, the main problem is that um, uh, GraphQL, obviously, you know, the protocol, protocol is different, right? So it does not use REST uh, methods, it just uses POST. Uh, generally, there's just single endpoint. Um, the big issue is that client can form arbitrary queries, right? Which, honestly, for security folks, when they first hear or first see GraphQL, that feels really strange, right? Because generally, we need to work quite a lot to get something like command injection, right? Where, where SQL injection, right? Where you can uh, run arbitrary SQL, for example, code on a remote server. That's a vulnerability by itself. But in GraphQL, that just comes with the territory, right? You can allow clients generally to run arbitrary queries against your data. So that sounds really strange, honestly insecure, but the thing is that GraphQL spec is quite modern. So the folks who were involved in that, they actually thought about many, you know, a lot of stuff. And there are, the defaults for the most part are secure, although the problem, as I mentioned, is that GraphQL infrastructure is so uh, fragmented, right? So uh, that might be the, the main problem, right? So if you're not using kind of the, the most, uh, you know, the best tested and, you know, the, the, the most, I'd say, the most secure tools, right? Um, okay. Uh, the important thing is here is also that there's batch functionality involved, um, and there are two ways you know to do that. Basically, instead of sending one request, uh, instead of sending multiple requests, you can, as an attacker, you can just combine them and send just one. So, first method is probably well known. It's based on aliases. It's a standard feature. It's better known, so usually it's you know limited by default. But there's also another feature which is not standard, implemented you know just by some servers. Um, Cool thing is that it allows mixing arbitrary queries and even queries imitations. So yeah, um, denial of service as a first practical thing. And before I start, there's a public service announcement. Uh, yesterday, Cloudflare and Google and Amazon uh, published you know, some information about the zero day. So this is an attack that has just been disclosed. Um, it's a kind of really powerful way to DDoS, right? So basically to run a denial of service against your servers. Um, generally, this is something your security team and DevOps uh, should kind of address, right? But, you know, so just wanted to put it out. So, you know, if, if this is something that, uh, basically if you're using HTTP2, which probably everybody is using, right? This is probably, unless someone else is taking care of it, you should take a, you know, look at this. Okay, so denial of service protection in GraphQL. So some of this actually comes by default. So for example, linters, right? Generally, this is part of specification. Um, there's also complexity analysis, which is not enabled by, by default in the most cases. And there's uh, you know, some more kind of generic functionality like timeouts and rate limits, which is not just applicable to GraphQL, but which kind of you, know, you need to pay attention to GraphQL specific stuff there. Um, and yeah, by the way, uh, denial of service, of course, is kind of complicated, right? So most of the attacks that we see in the news, there will be a low level attacks, like the, the one I mentioned before, right, from the cloud flash. So that would be on TCP level, or UDP level, or just you know, tra traffic amplification, something like that, um, HTTP level maybe. Uh, GraphQL, that's usually kind of supposed to be, I guess, OC level seven, right? So application level. So pretty high. Uh, the issue though is that, you know, if you generally, as an attacker, if you find vulnerability, denial of service vulnerability in GraphQL service, Generally, that will allow you to take down the system with just you know, a mobile phone, right? So you don't need that many requests for that. So that's the hugest, you know, biggest difference. But it's probably yeah, le less known, I guess, right? Because most of the services, uh, denial of service kind of, uh, denial of services uh, which are offered you know, um, as, a, as a service, denial of service as a service, generally you know, they don't do application uh, level attacks. Okay, so linters. This is kind of cool functionality which is handled by specification. For example, you have uh, two fragments which are circular dependency, right? Unless, if you were to implement GraphQL yourself and you don't pay attention to this, this is a really easy way, you know, to, uh, you know, do a deep, deep denial service. For the most part, if you are using a mature ecosystem, this will be handled by default. Complexity analysis, generally, either just a toggle that you enable, uh, or, you know, a library that you, that's easy to integrate. Uh, the issue here is that um, uh, it's kind of hard to uh, estimate uh, this computational cost, and sometimes an uh, automatic complexity analysis does, is not aware of how expensive specific resolver, of course, is, right? So again, you need to kind of pay, pay attention to that. And you, you generally, you need to enable this. Um, and then, you know, the timeout. Uh, 
So the issue here is kind of the main approach is the same as you would protect any other uh, API services. You need to uh, make sure that your timeout policies are clear, universal, that they apply. There's a global timeout that is applied you know, to entire requests, but there also might be granule controls on resolver and on database uh, level. Um, but the thing is that you might also be using you know, some kind of previously existing you know, rate limiting protection, which kind of might even look like it's working. But if you just plug in GraphQL and the tool is not aware of GraphQL, it will break because what I mentioned before. So for example, quite often um, GraphQL requests to non-GraphQL aware tools look like you know, the first line, right? So it will just be uh, hitting one endpoint. If you are using some you know, even fancy anomaly detection or something like that, this endpoint will get whitelisted because there will be so much traffic there. So there's no rate limit protection there. And you know, uh, sometimes you see this kind of uh, second form where it kind of might look that there are uh, requests go to different endpoints, but actually as an attacker, you can just uh, you know, use the same endpoint for everything. This is not security, this is just uh, convenience. Um, finally, uh, GraphQL schemas in real world are large, very large, and generally the same data is exposed in multiple pl uh, places, right? So there's a really cool tool, GraphQL Voyager, that you might use to interactively view, interactively view your schema uh, um, if it's not too big, right? If it's too big, you need some kind of automation. Um, and the problem here is that sometimes um, it's easy to detect when the same data is exposed in multiple places just because it's the same GraphQL type, but it also sometimes is just different types, but functionally the data is the same. It comes from the same source. So as an attacker, um, it's really important if you, for example, are implementing timeouts, right, and rate limiting protection, it's important that it is aware of all of these types, right? So you're not just protecting user data only in one path, right? Um, and here we actually go to the you know, next topic, insufficient authorization and also information disclosure, and it's quite related to this first slide, right? Uh, because for information disclosure specifically, uh, quite often what you will have, you, you have some kind of data which is kind of treated as public, uh, but you don't want to make it too easy for an attacker to just dump all of that data, right? So you would implement, again, the protection would be the same as denial of service protection, right, limiting, right? And, um, maybe timeouts, right? Um, so you, you want to limit how much data uh, attackers can uh, get out of your database. Again, you need to make sure that whatever data you are protecting, you are protecting it, protecting it in all of the uh, paths that is, it's accessible. But there are also some you know, other causes of information disclosure. And besides, you know, rate limiting. Um, so the main problem in GraphQL is authorization. Uh, and specifically, I want to mention, you know, other vulnerabilities. Um, so for authorization, the main problem is, uh, as I mentioned, I'm not an uh, expert, right? And I'm also I'm not an Apollo developer. Uh, so I don't want to talk about best practices and authorization. There are some other talks that you might be interested in. I'm interested in as well. Um, but what we are seeing in practice Pretty much every client that we engage with has a different strategy of doing authorization, right? And that's a bad sign, bad sign, because there's clear, clearly there's no established best practices. There's no one way to do that. Um, so I can't really rec recommend you, you know, one way to do that, because it's usually very dependent on other infrastructure that you are using, specific tooling servers, and also of some other, uh, like how you are doing authorization in non-GraphQL endpoints, right? If you're implementing GraphQL in an existing system. So it's a little bit complicated, sometimes very complicated. Um, but the thing uh, that you definitely should be kind of working towards is for making authorization auditable, right? I think that's the key uh, aspect, really. Because when the client comes to us and either they have a really nice, really kind of easy you know, to, to look schemas, just to understand exactly which data is authorized to, to which user, no matter how you know, they actually get that data. It's uh, you know, much easier. We spend less time on auditing that, that system. Also, if, it might not be just you know, a spreadsheet, but if, it, if you're using the same patterns as a you know, security consultancy, we will just write a script, right, if it's doable. And we will just you know, grab that data out of your source code, right? And we will build a spreadsheet ourselves. That's not a problem, right? But if you are using all kinds of different uh, authorization mechanisms across your you know, source code, it becomes much harder to actually um, you know, audit, right? And when it's something that's hard to audit, probably you haven't thought about it as well. Probably there's some you know, legacy stuff going on. And you know, probably if you spend uh, long enough on that, we will find some deficiencies. So 
Um, yeah, but one specific uh, problem with you know, insufficient authorization. This is a very common pattern is in GraphQL specifically, although it doesn't apply just to GraphQL. And this is idler, insecure direct object reference. And basically, this is a vulnerability when you have an internal object ID for some object, and that object ID is supplied by the client, and you do, do not do some you know, authorization checks to make sure that only client actually is authorized to, to use that, right? So as a practical example, here's a query. Hope you can see it. Um, and the query just returns, you know, my data, right? Andrew Konstantinov. And, you know, I am actually uh, up supplying, as the client, I'm supplying this ID, 103, right? But if, as, as an attacker, I notice that, and I try to play with it, right? So I will run the same query, but I will just supply a different, you know, variable uh, value, right, 101. Then I will get someone else's data. That's the idler. Right? So really kind of easy vulnerability, I think. It's, it's not that hard to find it, not that hard to exploit it. You just need to be methodo methodological, I guess, about it, right? Um, of course, in, in real life, it kind of becomes more complicated. And the main kind of complication usually is that you will not be using uh, easily brute forcible IDs, like, you know, one, two, three, but you will be using something unguessable, like very commonly it's UUID v4, right? It's random, it's really large, Right, so unless you know there are some you know, crypto, crypto, cryptographical problems, generally this is not something I can actually exploit directly. But it's still a vulnerability, right? If you are not checking that you know once you supply the someone else's uh, UUID, you're not checking that I'm actually authorized to do that. Um, so yeah, uh, the problem is that there are multiple ways we can still exploit this sometimes, um, and it depends on you know some some other. Uh, uh, vulnerabilities, such as UUID leakage, right? Where, so basically where you can, for example, you send an invite to a, another user, right? To, to join them in your, I don't know, group or something, right? And maybe in that request, like the response actually comes with UUID, right? So that might be an easy way to map emails to UUIDs. Or uh, there might be just relationships, because again, GraphQL schemas generally are really hard to understand. They are really large. There are many connections. So generally, Often it's possible, you know, to find some path to get that information. And uh, the, finally, there are, you know, some uh, gadgets that you might have in your infrastructure which allows us mapping guessable IDs to unguessable, like UUID. So, for example, here's an example where uh, I am supplying, you know, a query to check my friends, and in the result there are some UUID, you know, this, this is not UUID, but, right, you can imagine that this is, you know, something unguessable. I wouldn't be able to guess it, but I can... Uh, you know, using this endpoint, I, I can just grab that data. Um, there's also um, the same example, actually, I think I, I used before, which is error messages, right? Again, generally, some kind of service, you know, uh, in some conditions. Uh, sometimes this is actually directly uh, caused by authorization flows, right? So if you use, if you uh, try to do some uh, request where you don't have authorization, it will produce an error, but if the error comes from a downstream service, the error might, for example, contain internal object ID, right? So an easy way to actually, you know, um, enumerate users. Okay, and finally, the last kind of topic, injection vulnerabilities. So for a security researcher, um, you know, injection vulnerabilities are generally the most interesting ones because these are generally, uh, like if you find a SQL injection or common injection, often they will be high or critical severity, right? So impact is pretty high. Uh, the thing is that GraphQL uh, does a lot of stuff. The main thing is that there's a strong typing, right? And strong typing actually is a really good thing. It uh, protects against a lot of stuff. So, for example, if there's, uh, if a type is, you know, an integer, as an attacker, even if I try, you know, to modify it and send you a string, like a malicious string, it will just not pass on that first stage, right? So as a developer, you're not doing anything. You're, you, you've just, you know, deployed your uh, typing system. That's it. And you know, even if there is a vulnerability in a downstream service, such as like SQL injection, you might not be able to exploit it as an attacker. So that's a good thing. But strings themselves, obviously, still are not validated, right? Automatically, I mean, right? So you, still, you need to pay attention to this, uh, you know, problem, just like in any other service, and you still need to kind of do the, you know, general stuff that you do, right? Don't trust user input. Make sure that it's sanitized, validated, and so on. Um, one thing, really important one, which is kind of GraphQL related, are custom scalars. 
right? So if you are using this functionality, especially if it's you know, not a well-known mature version, but you know, something you developed in-house, you need to pay, pay attention because, again, custom scalars are not protected by typing system. So here's an example. Um, there's a, you know, a, a simple schema. There's a request where a user can supply a value, which is kind of meant to be a string. But it's actually a custom, uh, custom scalar, right? Not a, not a real string. And because there is no validation, assuming there is no validation on the back end, right, for that, as an attacker, I would be able to supply an object, a dictionary here, right, with key value. So that's a wrong type. If the service, server is actually MongoDB, this is a straightforward NoSQL injection, right? So generally, it, it might, for example, sometimes this is the attack that you can use just to bypass the logging flow, right? So in a, in, instead of passing actually password, right, or username, you, you insert this kind of stuff, and instead of checking user with a password, it will check a user, and it will check the password does not match. So yeah, you will get an admin, right? Um, yeah, here, here's an example of you know, vulnerable string. Uh, not string, actually, uh, an object. Um, so these are the main problems, and you know, just you know, to summarize what I would like you, know, you to take out of this talk, first of all, do not rely on security through obscurity. Just because some information is not available, or even if you've paid, you know, uh, you know, attention to protect, uh, you know, some data from leakage, just assume that that information is available because you know it can get leaked in so many ways. Uh, sometimes attackers can just pay, you know, your former developers, for example, you know, to, to get that information. Um, enable complexity analysis because that's a crucial thing, which kind of together with timeouts and you know other stuff, it protects. Uh, your query, right, from the now service conditions, and usually it's not enabled by default. Um, make sure that whatever you're doing for timeouts and rate limits is GraphQL aware, because it's really easy to mess it up, right, especially if you are using, uh, so basically if you are kind of developing GraphQL system, but the rate limiting and uh, timeouts are managed by some, someone else, right, like security team, for example, right? Sometimes the security team will just rely on existing kind of scenarios, right, which might not be, you know, might not work for GraphQL. Um, whatever you are using for the authorization scheme, make sure it's easy to audit, right? Ideally, if you have, you know, some kind of, you know, spreadsheet or something like that where you can do it yourself and provide, if you have that, provide that, you know, to, to penetration testers because it will just make their life easier and, you know, you will get more value out of your money. Um, and don't rely on UUID for security, for sure. Also, if you're using custom scalars, pay attention to that. So that's my talk. Um, Thank you for your attention. Um, we're interested in feedback, so journal, yeah, if you can, please fill out the form. And um, we actually have, uh, so yeah, you, you can you know, contact us. You can also check out our blog post. Uh, blog post. Um, we have a table uh, at the vendor area. So if you are interested in you know, uh, doing sec uh, ideas about your scenarios, we can provide you, know, you some uh, free consultations right now, right? So just uh, come and visit. We have a bunch of people there that are technical and, uh, uh, you know, very professional. Thank you for your attention.